Good evening. My name is Dr. David Highmarsh, and this is the second of our stats video series. And this one, we're taking a deeper dive into the normal distribution. The aim of this is that we're going to cover the normal distribution, talk about confidence intervals, touch on skewed data, and finally a bit of comparison on data. I'll utilize some real world examples to try and illustrate the point a bit more for those who find this subject difficult. So, as touched on on video one, we're looking at a normal distribution uh, is where the mean, median, and mode all uh, are the same, okay, and the data distributed forms a symmetrical view around uh, this axis, okay, and this is called a normal or Gaussian distribution, okay, and we can see here that a group of people are lined up in height order, and you can see that each of the groups that lined up are in the same rough um, height to each other, and they form a normal distribution, but more on that later. So when we start getting lots of data, we need to see uh, how much variation there is around the mean. Okay, And this is called standard deviation. It's a crude description, but it's getting an idea. Uh, and it's denoted by the Greek letter sigma. And you can see the uh, sigma symbol there. Now, what we normally do in scientific terms is that we want to cover the 95% area and what we mean by that is is that we'll take the mean and we'll do a plus minus of 1.96 of the standard deviation that's about as far as into the actual uh, formulae for this that we're going to go you can see though that each level of uh, standard deviation will get you a slightly higher percentage okay as stated normally we go for 95 percent so that falls just below that uh, two standard deviations um, and this is just a scientific norm though if you wanted to prove your point statistically you'd go to higher strengths and powers i.e pushing towards the 99 percent but we'll stick for 95 percent for, for a start so the theory being that if a value falls above or below the 95 percent value that this can be deemed significant okay and what we mean by that is that it, it is a very unlikely that this is to have risen by chance alone Okay, but that unlikelihood means that we can make a mistake, okay, and that's where we get type 1 and type 2 errors. Whenever we're doing any form of experiment, uh, we need to make a null hypothesis, and generally the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the two sets of data, or there is no difference in the data set that we're uh, examining, um, and so because of that, uh, a type 1 error is when we falsely reject the, high, uh, the null hypothesis, i.e. we try and say that there is a uh, something statistically significant uh, where there in fact isn't. And on the reverse of type 2 errors, when we falsely accept the null hypothesis um, where actually there is something wrong in that data set. And we'll go back to our heights just to try and sort of flesh this out because it can be quite a tricky concept to get your head around. So go back to our heights. And we've got all these people lined up in this class. And we're going to do a screening program. And this screening program is looking for endocrine abnormalities. And what we're going to do is we're going to screen two groups of people. Those who are deemed significantly high and those who are deemed significantly short will be screened. Okay. So the null hypothesis is that there is no significance in the extremes of heights, i.e. if we were to run a whole load of endocrine abnormalities on them, uh, or, or screening tests, there'll be nothing absolute wrong with them. The alternative hypothesis is that there is significance at these extremes, that these people are hiding unknown endocrine abnormalities that we can subsequently treat. So we go back to our population. We apply our 95% confidence interval, so we've got our upper and lower limits, and you can see that we've got two groups, one on the left and one on the right, that will subsequently go for screening. Now, a type 1 error is that when someone in this group is actually plumb normal, okay? Um, so I use height as a prime example because people can be short for whatever reasons. It can be completely normal. It doesn't mean to say that they've got some horrendous medical condition that needs to be treated or monitored. It can just be a lovely, lovely normal variation um, amongst our population. 
Likewise, a type 2 error then is someone in the middle group who does have something wrong with them, so this endocrine abnormality in this example, but isn't picked up and isn't screened because we've used this crude uh, data analysis to try and uh, see where this uh, experimentation goes. For those observant amongst you, you've probably got to halfway through this video by now and gone, hang on a second, Dave. Uh, this data isn't quite symmetrical, as you quite freely stated. Now, that was partly artistic license, just to try and get the point across, but you're perfectly right. And you can see here, as circled, there is a large group of people more towards the left-hand side, representing that there is a high proportion of um, sort of shorter people represented in this population. Okay. So the mode will probably stay the same. So the modal group, the most commonly frequently occurring group is there as designated by the line. Can't really change that. But as we've discussed before on our previous video, as soon as we've got these extremes at the right of the graph, that will artificially drag the mean higher. Okay, so we'll pull it across to the right hand side. And then the median, the middle value we'll estimate is somewhere in between the two. Okay, and this, it's called a positive skewed data. Now, I've pulled up this graph because it actually shows a bit better um, of how the graph should actually look rather than the artificial one we've done just to keep things going. Now, we can call it right skewed or classically called positive skewed uh, data for this one. And likewise, we can get its uh, mirror and that's negative skewed. Now, in all cases, uh, the mean, median, and mode will be reported in the same order, and these are thankfully in alphabetical order. Okay, so in a normal distribution, it'd be mean, median, mode are all the same, and they equal each other. In negative, the mean is less than the median, which is less than the mode, and the positive, the mean is higher than the median, which is higher than the mode. Okay, this is a very crude and quick simple uh, one point in the AKT that I've seen pop up and also on practice papers time and time again so it's well worth just being familiar with this slide so that you can rattle it off. I remember mean med mod uh, it's in alphabetical order and then I fill in the negative and positive. <coughs> so the use comes out when we're comparing two sets of data. Now each set of data will have its own normal distribution and its own 95% confidence intervals. And when we're looking at, say, a new drug or a new treatment, that we want to see whether there is a significant difference between those two groups. Okay, and this is where we use uh, clinical statisticians to make sure that we've done the calculations correctly um, and adjusted for it accordingly. Okay, so we're going to apply this to a real-world example. What I've done is I've taken the abstract, I've tweaked the numbers and just thinned it out so it's more... Uh, palatable for an educational purposes. So we're looking at the efficacy of intravenous paracetamol versus IV morphine and acute limb trauma. So this is a randomized double-blind clinical trial. All patients were aged 18 years and older with acute limb trauma and a pain score greater than 3 out of 10 in the ED. Uh, they received either a gram of paracetamol IV or IV morphine over 15 minutes. Results, uh, so 60 patients were uh, randomly received either paracetamol or morphine. The mean reduction in numerical rating scale, uh, scale pain intensity scores at 30 minutes was 1.94 uh, for paracetamol and 5.16 for morphine. The pain relief was significantly higher in the morphine group uh, compared to the paracetamol group with a p-value of less than 0.01. Now... Taking this apart, uh, sometimes it helps just to visualize this. So we have got two sets of data that have been presented to us, okay? And the data set that we're looking at is the mean reduction in numerical rating uh, of pain, okay? So how much has it reduced your pain from, say, 9 out of 10 down to, say, 6 out of 10, okay? Now, both of them give the mean score, so for paracetamol, 1.94, and the plus minus represent the two confidence intervals. So the upper limit, you go plus 1.61, and the minus limit of, uh, so 1.94 minus 1.61. Okay, so we can start to plot this on the graph. So realistically, if we're talking about mean reduction, we've got number of patients, we've got reduction in pain scale, and you could either got a decreased score, i.e. the pain got better, or you got an increased score, so the pain got worse. Okay. Realistically, they're not giving us any 
negative example, so we ignore the uh, negative access, and we'll just have a uh, we'll continue on. So we've got our IV paracetamol group, and we've got our IV morphine group. We know that with the IV morphine, they're giving us a mean of 5.16, uh, and because we it's plus minus the 1.39, we know then that the upper limits are uh, 6.55 and 3.77. And likewise, we know the same with IV paracetamol. So that gap between the two, the author has given us that there is a difference uh, with a p-value of less, point, uh, less than 0 0.01, which means that there is a significant difference between the two groups, i.e. morphine is better able to treat uh, pain than IV paracetamol. So that concludes our video for tonight. We've covered normal distribution, confidence intervals, skewed data, and also comparison of data. If you like the video, please, please, please hit the like button and subscribe and comment below for uh, video suggestions and we'll continue on to complete the statistics series. Many thanks and have a great evening.